认识人间佛教吗？一场学者与行者的对话即将展开。Auspicious greetings. My name is Jue Wei, and I am the head of program for Humanistic Buddhism and director of the Humanistic Buddhism Centre in Nantian Institute, Australia. On behalf of the Fo Guangshan Institute of Humanistic Buddhism's community, I would like to thank you for joining us online for this panel series of ten lectures on Humanistic Buddhism. This series of panels was envisioned to bring together distinguished scholars and eminent practitioners to provide insightful directions to finding a balance between the theory and practice of the Buddha's teachings. Such insights will be crucial as we forge ahead to identify Buddhist solutions to modern-day social issues. In the tradition of this series founder, Venerable Master Xingyun, the contents are designed for a broad audience who may be interested in finding humanistic solutions to contemporary issues in our increasingly complex and volatile world. Today, I'm deeply honored to introduce the speakers for the panel: Emeritus Professor Louis Lancaster. And Venerable Miao Guang, Emeritus Professor Louis Lancaster is one of the most renowned Buddhist studies scholars in the world today. Since 1968, he has held prestigious positions at the University of California, such as Chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Chair of the Center for Korean Studies. His projects have been hugely impactful. And many of which have integrated computer-based technology to contextualize scholarly content, such as the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative (ECI). In 2014, Dr. Lancaster won the Manhei Prize from the Korean Buddhist Foundation for his digital Korean Buddhist canon endeavor. Today, he continues to teach at the University of the West. And consults on projects in Fo Guangshan's Institute of Humanistic Buddhism and here at Nantian Institute. Venerable Miao Guang is the personal English interpreter of Venerable Master Xingyun. She is currently serving at the Institute of Humanistic Buddhism as both its Deputy Chancellor and Director of the Department of International Affairs. She is also the director of two mega English translation projects, the Fo Guang Dictionary of Buddhism, and the complete works of Venerable Master Xingyun. Venerable Miao Guang also lectures and advises projects in Nanhua University in Taiwan, Guangming College in the Philippines, University of the West in America, and Nantian Institute in Australia. Today's panel. Is entitled Prajna Paramita in the Humanistic Buddhism Perspective. Dr. Lancaster will unravel the Bodhisattva in the Perfection of Wisdom Buddhist texts. Venerable Miao Guang will provide a response based on the pragmatic and experiential perspectives of Fo Guangshan. It is now my honor and privilege to hand over the proceedings. To Emeritus Professor Louis Lancaster, thank you. Thank you very much, Venerable Jiwei, and to、uh, Venerable Miao Guang and all of the people at Fo Guangshan. I appreciate the opportunity to share again some of my thoughts. You know, at the beginning of the Heart Sutra, we read that the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. Looked down and realized that all aspects of human experience are empty. Having seen this, he was liberated from anguish, suffering. 
I've translated the word skanda as aspects of human experience instead of the more common equivalent of aggregate. The five skandhas are about perceiving, naming, conceptualizing, and being conscious of our sensory input. So I'm interpreting this to be aspects of human experience. Once Avalokiteshvara was freed from a misunderstanding of the nature of human experience, he achieved a state that was free of anguish and disappointment. Three years ago, <clears throat> on what was probably my last field trip involving long hikes and off-road travel, I was taken to an ancient archaeological site in Sri Lanka. It was a coastal site <clears throat> some distance from any large population center. And we drove through down unpaved roads into the jungle growth. For centuries, the site had been a thriving commercial center based on the copper ore deposits there. Underneath the years of forest growth lay mounds of the remains of the smelting of the copper ore to produce ingots of the metal for shipment by sea to distant ports. Eventually, the ore was exhausted and the place abandoned. But on a hilltop, overlooking the area and the inlet that once served ocean-going vessels, archaeologists found an inscription. It says, Avalokiteshvara looks down and bows to protect sailors. Sri Lanka at the time was dominated by Mahayana, and Avalokiteshvara was a Mahayana Bodhisattva who was considered to be the patron of, of sailors. I was really moved by standing on that hilltop, looking down to the inlet, imagining what it must have been like when the large ships came to collect their cargo of copper. The sailors on board these vessels were fully aware of the dangers of the long open sea voyages that awaited them. They had sought to have some form of protection and they turned to the Bodhisattva for his promise of looking down to give them aid. Constructing a shrine on the hill overlooking their anchorage they carved the words that expressed faith in a bodhisattva to help them through all the dangers of their life on the open seas. I think that inscription tells us an important story about the fact that ordinary people viewed bodhisattvas as protectors in everyday life. They were not considered to be only in remote caves or forests doing meditation. But they were present even in the bustle of a busy seaport. Now, in the 8,000 line Prajnaparamita Sutra, the teaching is done, strangely enough, by Arhats, the Buddha, Subhuti, Shariputra. Ananda, only Maitreya described as still a bodhisattva in Tushita heaven has a few passages which can be said to be the direct teaching of his own. But he's a bodhisattva who is heading for Buddhahood in his last and next rebirth. Just like Shakyamuni in his past lives was identified as a bodhisattva. In the main body of the sutra, surprisingly enough, there is no passage that contains the words of a bodhisattva of the type being praised by the arhats. Our Prajnaparamita Sutra is for the main merely descriptive of the activities of bodhisattvas. We're told 
what they learn, how they meditate, what journeys they take. They are ideals that are held up as examples for others to follow. For example, in the Heart Sutra, the experience of Avalokiteshvara is described, but the teaching is still in the voice of the Buddha. It is not until we come to the Jataka tale at the end of the sutra that we have examples of what a bodhisattva actually taught. There we find an aspiring bodhisattva, Sadaparudita, searching for and finding a bodhisattva who can teach him. He finally arrives at the place where Dharmagata is staying. His request for teaching is met by Dharmagata, who begins with a formal statement about Prajnaparamita. These, I'm going to quote, are the first words in the Prajnaparamita Sutra that are attributed directly to a bodhisattva. Dharmagata said, O oh, gentle son, the Tathagata teaches that all things are unreal, like a dream. If a person does not know this, they will grasp at names, words, and expressions for the body. Such people will imagine the Buddhas are coming and going, but they do not know the reality of things. A person who imagines the Buddhas as coming and going is foolish and ignorant, continuously undergoing birth and death, coming and going in the six destinies. They are separated from the Prajnaparamita and the Buddha Dharma. Now, when Dharmagata finishes his first discourse, he enters into a deep state of samadhi and does not teach again until he emerges from this meditative trance. As he comes out of his trance, he speaks of his insights. In Mahayana, it would appear that a bodhisattva, as well as a Buddha, first enters samadhi, and the audience gathers around the meditating figure waiting for him to come out of the trance state and speak. In the case of Dharmagata, his first words are a long metric verse. Everything being equal, Prajnaparamita is equal. Everything being separated, Prajnaparamita is separated. Everything being immovable. Prajnaparamita is immovable. Everything being without thought. Prajnaparamita is without thought. His message is that Prajnaparamita is no different from all the other aspects of human experience. It is not something that is separated and different. If we know what is really the case with thought or the nature of the world around us, indeed with everything, we know what is really the case with Prajnaparamita at that point. This leads us to consider the nature of samadhi and the experiences practitioners have while doing meditation. While well, Theravada Pali texts give us the name of three samadhis, Mahayana texts have multiple listening that provide names for hundreds of them. And when the Bodhisattva Sadaparudita heard the teaching of Dharmagata that followed his samadhi, the next text tells us, quote, then Sadaparudita Bodhisattva, upon that very seat, attain the samadhi in which everything is equal, the samadhi in which things are separated, the samadhi in which things are immovable, the samadhi in which thoughts, things are without thought. 
In other words, so Sadapuridita was led to enter the same trance states as those of Dharmagata. And a name was given for each one of them. Having had this experience of hearing about the insights of the teacher, Sadapuridita then has the ability to have those same samadhis. The teaching is no longer just something he has heard it becomes something he experiences. Now the pattern of a teacher first entering a profound mental state with all the realization that results, gives the view that only the teaching of one who has, changed, has achieved such states is worthy to be heard. This suggests that the source of Buddhist thought expressed in the sutra is to be found in the samadhi trances of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas. Another example of this is the well-known Lotus Sutra. We are told that while teaching, the Buddha enters samadhi and the audience around him wait until he emerges from the meditation. The words that he spoke at that point are the content of the sutra. We're not told what he, what the, the first teaching that he taught before he paused and went into that deep state of concentration. I believe we should pay close attention to these descriptions of the process by which the sutras describe their own appearance. We should also search for those teachings which are related to the bodhisattvas and their insights compared to the ones given by the Buddha and his disciples who were considered arhats. This exploration is a search for the way in which bodhisattvas were thought to teach. The Dharma of the Buddha and the arhat was seen as primary and nothing which the bodhisattvas teach was considered to be in conflict. However, the style of presenting the material is different. And this raises the question of whether bodhisattvas had their own style of teaching. For the 8,000 line Prajnaparamita, the main body of the sutra is in the format of a dialogue. While the Jataka portion with the teaching of a bodhisattva is narrative. In other words, the narrative makes the material much more available for an audience. So I recommend that you read both types and see how each one communicates the Dharma. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster, for reminding us that the Popular Heart Sutra helps us to be free from misunderstanding of human experience so that we can relieve anguish and confusion. Indeed, the human experience is often moving and the perfection of wisdom texts help us to see these experiences as they really are, that they are nothing more or less than the Prajnaparamita itself. Next, let us unpack the pragmatic and experiential perspectives of Fo Guangshan for this, I now turn the floor to Venerable Miao Guang. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Jue Wei, and thank you, Dr. Lancaster, for the very insightful and concise introduction of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva's experience. And today, I would also like to share a little bit about my explorations of the Pranyaparamita based on my experiences at Foguangshan and also as the interpreter to our founder, Venerable Master Xingyun. As you have heard Dr. Lancaster's uh, presentation or description of the story within the sutra, this brings back memories about my first experiences as a Buddhist. When we were young, as we attended the rituals or the ceremonies at the temple, 
we, we were always told by the venerable that by laying prostrations and chanting to the Buddha, we have a chance to connect with the Buddha in the highest form, that is prana. So in those early days, when we asked the question of what is prana or prana paramita, these are probably the answers that we receive most commonly. That prana is beyond land knowledge and wisdom. It is the ultimate freedom and it gives us the in infinite potential. It is our true face and our true thusness and Buddha nature. Certainly, these answers gave me a chance to look up and high about my ultimate goal as a Buddhist. But as I journey down the path of my life as a monastic, whenever I ponder over the meaning of the Dharma during my meditative practices, as well as my study of the Sutra, sometimes I tend to feel stuck and lost as to how exactly do I realize these highest and supreme levels of attainment? And later on in my life, Venerable Master Xing Yun shared some more answers to help us dwell deeper into the meaning of prana on all levels. He shared with us that prana is a beacon of light in the sea of dukkha. So when it is all dark and we are drowning, sometimes a little ray of light will guide us in some kind of direction out of that sea. It is also the teaching of liberation and eternal joy, given that if we ever attain an understanding of prana, right, we're bound to liberate ourselves from the shackles that we create out of a sense of Atman and that we are closer to eternal joy. We are also told that it is the origin and basis of being a human. So whatever it is we're at on the surface, when we have a chance to regain our calm and quiet, we see that prana within us. So overall, prana, as being told by our teacher, Venerable Master Xing Yun, he shares that it is the core of Buddhism. It is what enables us to live freely, most importantly, with self-mastery in this world. That is Ishvara. And so these two levels of answers to what prana is have set a very solid direction for my practices and my journey as a Dharma propagator. And certainly, uh, it has also been shared that when we look into the reason why Venerable Master Xing Yun has been able to successfully spread Buddhism across the world, especially in the name of humanistic Buddhism, we see two main reasons. First of all, throughout his 90 years of life, he has always guarded the fundamentals of the Buddhist faith. He never deviated far. And secondly, we all benefited from his amazing ability to creatively apply upaya or skillful means so that we too learn to enjoy the wonders of Dharma. And so what kind of prana paramita have I been able to learn from his personal um, examples as well as his teachings? I see these in two parts. In our journey to acquire prana paramita, First of all, we must never deviate far from the core teachings, that is the Buddha's fundamental teachings. And secondly, it is key to how we understand these teachings by establishing skillful application of knowledge and mindset. Thirdly, how do we apply prana wisdom in, by living it as a part of our life as we continue to grow as a human being? Last but not least, when we do one, two, three, what is our ultimate goal? That is an attainment of the highest level of awareness that we are all at one with other sentient beings. That is the point where we fully unite with our self-compassion as well as wisdom to really see life from the peak of Pranya Paramita. So very quickly, what is the core of the Buddha's fundamental teachings? I remember back in the early 2000s when Venerable Master Xing Yun was giving a talk at Fo Guangshan in front of a crowd of 800. Suddenly, there was an earthquake at about a richter scale of four. And shaking at scale four, um, basically the auditorium rocked. So people started to panic. Some tried to leave their seat. 
But immediately at that moment, as Venerable Master was well into his teaching, he closed his eyes, joined his palms, and remained quiet. And as he did that, although the auditorium was still shaking, I could see immediately the rest of the audience also um, bathing in his own calm. They regained their sense of safety and wellness. And then as soon as the earthquake stopped, Venerable Master opened his eyes and went right back to the teaching. It was as if nothing ever happened. And so at that moment, what I saw was this wonderful demonstration of Is Ishvara, deeply rooted in Pranayaparamita. He presented his true self that was unshakable by the shackles of the external world. And so it was as if I saw a live demonstration of the opening of the Heart Sutra. How do we overcome all ills and suffering? It is by causing deep in Pranayaparamita that realizing whatever it is we experience as a human, they are in essence empty and there's no need to hold on to them, cling to them, or be deeply affected by them. Therefore, what is the core of the Buddha's fundamental teachings to help us attain prana wisdom? I would say it's simply to understand where dukkha comes from, and then we apply that proper cure in order to transcend the suffering. And what are these core teachings? Well, on the left column, you see the very fundamental teachings of the Buddha that gives us a sense of patience or sankti on three levels, ordinary, dharma, and non-arising dharmas. So on the ordinary level, it gives us the strength so that we survive the everyday phenomena of this world. In other words, we have the courage to face the happenings without any desire to change them or to run away from them. And on the second level, Venerable Master Xingyun's calm demonstrates his transformation of knowledge into wisdom through his day-to-day -day connection with um, pranaparamita as well as compassion. So it is our power to sever these afflictions. Last but not least, on the level of Ishvara, since nothing ever really arises or ceases, why be bothered by anything at all? And so at that level, we see that every awareness of peace and freedom, no matter where we are or no matter who we are. So when we, when we are deeply rooted in the core of the fundamental teachings, next is about understanding. And in short, a very interesting uh, upaya or skill as to how we enhance our understanding is by the simple procedure of continuous questioning. In other words, the more you ask, the more you know. These are some of the questions posed by Venerable Master. As we observe the everyday happenings of the universe, he asks, human beings can now land the moon, but can this technology ever bring us to pure land? His answer, no. Rebirthing pure land is an instant of firm and unshakable belief. Only faith can bring us to pure land. So through this question, we find the true root to our faith. Never lose it. And secondly, he says, modern medical science can replace human organs to prolong life, but can they give us eternal life? Therefore, while we celebrate the advancement of human technology and medical science, he again, with this question, pulls us back to the root of Dharma by saying, no, by replacing parts of the conventional body, our physical life will still die. Only by discovering our innate Buddha can life be everlasting. So with that root established in our faith, we now have a clear goal. The third question, does exploring the limits of space lead to freedom from samsara? He says, no. Only prana wisdom can take us beyond the boundaries of birth and death. And so ultimately, he brings us back to the daily applications of our interconnectedness with reality. And so our goal, our root, and our applications are very clear. Now, as we come to the applications, right, how do we apply the Dharma? Again, by simply asking the question, what is the Dharma for? These are his answers. Well, we learn the Dharma to tame our unsettling minds with the calm and Ishvara demonstrated by the Bodhisattvas in their deep meditative concentration. Secondly, once we have that, 
It is important for us to inspire our compassion to reach out and help others. Otherwise, our attained wisdom and compassion will simply be in vain. Why be the only one to benefit from that? And so ultimately, when we combine one and two, we learn that the most important thing in our learning of the Dharma is to make sure that we are inspired to take meaningful actions. Remember, the writings in the sutras not only communicate the higher spirit of the Buddha, I believe that an even more important purpose of the languages in the sutra or the languages of Dharma is to make sure that we put it into action, even more meaningful actions. So through the Buddha's own examples, through the daily day-to-day -day routine of the Sangha of Six Reverend Harmony, to our day-to-day -day refuge taking, as well as our simple remembrance of any one line that will change our life forever, we are living the Dharma as a way of self-development. And so in this, Venerable Master Xing Yun applies and demonstrates through the later days of his life in his ailing body, when he's confined to a wheelchair, when he has lost 99% of his vision, he never lost his route to the Dharma. Even though he's no longer able to see or read, he says, I can still write the words of Dharma to inspire people. And on this picture, it may seem simple, but you may wonder when someone who has suffered from diabetes for more than 60 years, who cannot see, his hands shake. He has no idea where his pens, his brush is landing. These are the words he writes with such calm and composure as his compassionate willingness to share with us that, yes, remember, wherever you are, don't forget about the every awareness of your inner Buddha and that inner compassion that is displayed through the skillful applications of Pranayaparamita. I would like to uh, save some of these stories later um, as my um, responses to the questions Venerable Joe can lead. But I would like to go right to number four. Okay. So fourthly, having understood the core, finding a way to understand what prana wisdom is and experience the different ways to apply it, our ultimate attainment is to realize the oneness and coexistence among all beings. So what do we attain at the end of the day as we um, experience the presence of prana? First of all, never leave the ultimate teaching of inter interdependent co-arising because this gives us a sense of awareness that we are all equal. And as all equal living beings, there's no reason for us to uh, to not share unconditional acceptance to people who are different from us, to those who may share different values. And by doing so, we continue to coexist, and coexist with our fellow human beings and friends in the common presence of compassion and harmony. In other words, as a bodhisattva who progresses down the path of Buddhahood, their greatest realization is that only when all is happy, will a bodhisattva's happiness thereby be true. And certainly a couple of uh, methods shared by Venerable Master to realize equality, oneness, coexistence, compassion, and clear insight are through many of his conversations with the people he interacts with. For example, the young Filipino uh, students who come to study at Guamin College founded by him. He says, I don't know you, but you are part of my family, so I will do everything I can to help you. And in his most well-known visit to um, the September 11 attack, where he went to give a blessing, he unconditionally shared his prayer as a universal value amongst all religions. He said his prayer to not only Buddha, but also to God, to Allah, to Jesus, to Muhammad which touched the hearts of all those who were present, those of different racial, cultural, and um, national backgrounds. He opened their hearts with his sense of compassion and equality. And so at the end of the, the, the service, 
Although they had no idea who this Buddhist master was, all they wanted and needed at the end of that session was to walk up to him for a moment of blessing so that everybody too can feel the sense of Ishvara or self-mastery demonstrated by a Buddhist practitioner. So in close, the simple four steps to how we understand and apply Pranayaparamita all comes from a Buddhist master who dedicated his entire life to bring in the words of the sutras and the dharmas to real life. He says, for as long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm alive, I will dedicate every bit of my life, every bit of my energy, every bit of my effort to, to the benefit of the spiritual growth of all living beings. So to close, I would like to present to you this four part chart of how Venerable Master can help us understand Pranayaparamita and then actually practice it. Number one, the core, which is the Buddha's fundamental teachings. Number two, the only way to understand it is to skillfully apply it, to apply our knowledge and to establish that upaya mindset. And in application, never forget that it is a part of our daily life. And finally, the highest attainment of any bodhisattva is not just prana, but prana paired with the compassionate awareness that we are all one. So that is what I have to share. I hope it echoes Dr. Lancaster's insightful sharing of the Pranya Paramita Sutra. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Miao Guang, for sharing your personal journey of realizing the supreme prajna and sharing also Venerable Master Xing Yun's teachings to live freely and creatively with compassion and wisdom, even in the middle of an earthquake. You see how the bodhisattvas in the Buddhist texts come to life through us having confidence and faith in the inner Buddha that is already in all of us and our interconnectedness with reality. As many reach out to popular self-help books, let us not forget to also look at the lives of the noble people around us. It is now time for the more conversational part of the panel. There are some burning questions in my mind related to this panel's theme, and I would like to hear your responses. I know that both of you are deeply engaged in theory and practice, one informing the other in a reinforcing cycle. So here's my first question, Dr. Lancaster. How do you see the knowledge and practice of the perfection of wisdom as a bodhisattva guide us out of this global anxiety that the pandemic poses? Thank you. Um, uh, I remind myself that the definition of the Dharma is the way things really are. And I realized that when we heard just now from Venerable Melguang, in, in many ways, Master Xing Yun is always saying to people that The wisdom comes when we know the way things really are and we're able to deal with it and make a move toward solving some of the issues that life presents to us. But I ask myself one question and that is, why aren't we more wise? Why don't we have more of this? What is it that holds us back? And I think it's fear. We fear to know exactly what the situation is because we're not certain in our hearts of what is really the case. And so of course we fear the unknown. How do we overcome it? I think that one of the issues in my own country at this point is 
we are just being torn asunder by, by events in my country. I'm so distressed by that. And, and I believe that in order to begin to handle this, it has to be compassion for each other. I think you start there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster, for reminding us that wisdom comes from realizing the way things really are and for us not to allow fear to hold us back and constantly reminding us again as bodhisattvas the value of compassion. Venerable Miao Guang, you're very close to the pulse of the world. Would you like to add anything? Thank you, Venerable Jue Wei. Um, I feel that um, one of our ways to truly be free from the fears in life is to apply one of the greatest skills taught by not just the Buddhas, but also the Chan Masters. That is not to try to solve life's problem as one big problem, but to begin by solving the smaller problems that is immediately in front of us. And for Buddhists to be able to do this, it requires our constant mindfulness of the truths that we have learned about either impermanence, that all phenomena we experience are transient, about the need to not hold on to that Atman, which creates all the fires. But at the same time, it is about the constant connectedness with Pranayaparamita that gives us the Ishvara or the self-mastery, which all students or lear all learners of the Heart Sutra uh, pursue. And so again, this is one of my experiences with Venerable Master Xing Yun. This was probably about five years ago when he was confined to the wheelchair and was not able to see. Um, but he kept his life busy every day. Um, he received rounds of guests of up to sometimes five or ten every day. And, but one thing he did was he always received his guests at the entrance of the building. He never waited in his rooms. He wanted to make sure that all guests felt welcome and at home by his personal presence at the entrance. And so a usual part of his reception of guests would be this greeting at the door and the sharing of the journey or path back into the lounge. So this is one of those days when he was wheeled into, um, in towards the lounge with his guest. And when he was moved into an elevator, because there were so many people, as the door of the elevator, elevator was about to close, unfortunately, one of the monastics still tried to squeeze in, right? And then so she got wedged between the door. So at that time, everyone in the elevator did nothing but gasp by saying, oh, Omi Tuofo. Okay. But saying Omi Tuofo, as, as they said that, the monastic was still kind of stuck in between the elevator doors. If you have experience of that, sometimes it hurts, right? Sometimes it's kind of embarrassing. So Venerable Master at that moment turned to everyone and said the following. He says, at this moment, what is better than Amitabha Buddha is probably that finger of yours that reaches out to press the button of, that says open. Yeah. So that was so memorable. It again brought me back to the reality of Dharma in our everyday life. So the question of can Dharma solve our smallest problems in front of us? If we can do that, Right? It's like eating a whole cake bit by bit, bit by bit. You will no longer choke on the big pieces, but you learn to enjoy the every small piece that also gives you uh, the joy and the Ishvara. So for me, uh, I feel this is probably one of the ways I can try to be free or be, be, to be further from the faces of fear. Thank you, Venerable Miao Guang, for encouraging us to take baby steps through mindfulness of reality, and with practical, wise, and compassionate examples from Venerable Master Xing Yun. 
now I have a more personal question for you. As the English interpreter to the Venerable Master, you have had the privilege of observing a Buddhist master of tremendous compassion and wisdom. What is the most memorable moment to you in the way the Venerable Master has demonstrated the skillful wisdom of Prajna Paramita in his daily life? Okay, um, how much time do we have? I have a very <laughs> long question. <laughs> well, yes. it is the most, the most memorable <laughs> moment. Yes, indeed, um, the privilege of being able to observe almost a human version of the historical Buddha in front of me was not just his amazing uh, wisdom and compassion to really change people's lives. But the most memorable moment was probably sometimes, again, the smallest bits of fun um, that he shows. Um, he shows the innocence of his heart in the simplest moments of life that not only brings a smile to people's face, it also relieves people from sometimes their pain or suffering. Um, this is another moment. As Venerable Master Xing Yun travels the world a lot, everywhere he goes, he's almost received like a superstar. The devotees would be very excited to see him. And in many cases, he will be crowded by groups of people. So it was one of those days when we were on our way to the airport. And a group of, la of ladies, very well-dressed, elegantly dressed, ladies saw Venerable Master, uh, started to squeal and crowded Venerable Master Xing Yun. They just wanted a picture with him, right? And none of them wanted to miss the chance as we were moving. So they were scrambling. Therefore, in the process of scrambling, unfortunately, one of the very well-dressed ladies fell flat on her face. It was plain awkward, right? We were not sure what to do because it was meant to be the happiest moment of her day. And then it turned into a nightmare. And it was at that moment I saw Venerable Master's skillful wisdom in resolving the crisis. So he calmly turned to the lady and said, one prostration will do. <laughs> and we all started to laugh, right? Because in the Buddhist etiquette, like, it is the highest respect anybody can ever show to a Buddhist master when they see them, that is by laying prostrations. And usually out of courtesy, the Buddhist masters will say one prostration will do. Right? And so the lady, um, although awkward and embarrassed at first, right, kind of brushed it all away with that simple remark and it shifted everybody's attention. And so I, I truly appreciated that moment to see Venerable Master's immediate connection with the lady's feelings and emotions. And he rescued the moment and at the same time still left it to be the most memorable time, probably, of her life. And we will surely remember his compassion and skillful means for the rest of our lives, too. That is what I have to share. Thank you so much for this very interesting example. Indeed, a great Buddhist Chan master rescued the moment and created so much memory of how we should handle difficult situations in our lives to just think out of the box. Well, now, Dr. Lancaster, you too have had several occasions of intimate encounters with the Venerable Master. What are your observations around his skillful applications? Some years ago at uh, University of the West, we were privileged to have the Master come and give a series of lectures and it was early days, it was before Zoom, but we put it on the internet and we had people all over the country sending in questions. And one of the questions that came in was, someone asked him, please give me a mantra that will give me good luck. And we all sat waiting and I, I've learned that when he starts out basically saying, it seems to me, you know that you're going to get <laughs> an answer. I think that uh, 
for a, a bit, everybody, or at least some people, expected he would give her a mantra. But instead, he challenged her. And he, and he opened up a whole other way of dealing with life's problems. He said, it's been my experience that people who work hard are very lucky. And that was his answer to her. And I think that all of us in the audience felt here was a leader. Uh, he could play with uh, giving something to somebody who's probably a supporter. He could, in a sense, say, I, I have these things I can hand to you, I can give to you, I have a product. And he didn't do that. He did not take that opportunity to in any way uh, show that uh, he could be commodified, I would say. He said, as, as Venerable Malgron has told us, that people who work hard, people who put forth effort, and that's daily effort, in their jobs, with their families, with other people, with their own lives. These are the lucky people. These are the ones who really have the luck. I've never forgotten his answer. It was such a shock, but it was, it was perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster, indeed. Bodhisattvas are those who understand conditions. They don't deliver fixed solutions. They surprise us, but leave such memorable moments for all of us. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm sure everyone online will now agree with me that it takes really very good storytelling bodhisattvas here to be able to come close to and appreciate the wisdom of the Maha Bodhisattva, Venerable Master Xing Yun. So we are fortunate that time permits a couple more questions. So my next question for Dr. Lancaster is about the unfortunate power inequality that we are surrounded by. I cannot help but feel hurt by shootings targeted at the less privileged and how our precious environment is being raped. There is lack of safety in the world around us. How do you see communities practicing Prajnaparamita or individuals using Prajnaparamita to find hope and solace? I think that given our situation in the world, and I agree with you, it distresses me enormously. And particularly when I see in my own country uh, people being racist, I, I, I am so sorry for that. And the question is, what do you do about it? I think that what we have to say is, first of all, you have to know the way things really are the closer you can come to understanding exactly what's going on in the world, the closer we can come to perhaps solving it. It's like the COVID. When that virus came along, it was the scientists who could identify it. And once they identified it and said, this is what's causing this. And now we can make a vaccine that we can overcome this virus because we understand the nature of it. That, that's, that's the kind of wisdom which you use to, to apply your skill and means to bring about a good, a good solution. Thank you for inspiring us to start by understanding the way things really are. Now let me squeeze in one final question for Venerable Miao Guang. 
life tends to give you lemons more than you wish. So <laughs> as a Buddhist practitioner, how can Pragnya Paramita help you confront life's challenges and hardships? To answer the question simply, uh, I feel that the experience of suffering or the taste of life's lemons have now become a much more comforting experience for me as I continue to grow older. So I feel that it's a change of mindset towards something we can never avoid or prevent. When we were young, as young Buddhists, we wanted to make sure that we le are learning the Dharma so life will become perfect. And then as we grow older, we have come to peace with the fact that life can never be perfect. But I think 20 years into my journey as a Buddhist practitioner, I think I'm now into the third phase that uh, not only have I accepted the prevalence of suffering and challenges, I'm now ready to open my, ar my arms to welcome them because I know at that moment, only by accepting these challenges and sufferings in life will I open my door to change or personal growth. So although I may not yet have the wisdom or the skill to overcome this suffering, I feel that it's like I now know how to put myself into the driver's seat so I can begin to learn how to drive. And so I would say let every part of journey be a valuable experience for you. And without us having to label it as good or bad, because you never know, right? For people who fall, um, they could fall, you know, next to a pile of gold, for you, you, you never know, right? People who fail, that's only because another chance of success is waiting for them on a different path that they otherwise would never see had their, their original path been a smooth one. So I would say, again, the skills of Pranayaparamita is to keep us in, an insight, in a state of insightful awareness where we truly understand the Dharma or the world as they are. I mean, it's going to be a tough journey, but it's going to be very worthwhile. So hanging there, it's not the end when you taste lemon, Right? It's not the end when you fail. It's not the end when you suffer because more are yet to come. Thank you, Venerable Miao Guang. Perhaps it is not just age, but age in the Dharma is what is giving you the insight of what lemons really taste like. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I'm sure we can sit here all day to listen to both your experiences and wisdom. The nuanced perspectives that you both bring to the panel can inform the many novice bodhisattvas, like me, on the path to encounter uncertainties with faith and to witness our daily life experiences with an elevated form of consciousness. This dialogue goes beyond the classroom and the temple grounds, and it is only in a panel like this that we can explore with such clarity and intimacy. Finally, may I invite first Venerable Miao Guang and finally Dr. Lancaster to each share a short message of encouragement for everyone online. <laughs> Venerable Miao Guang. Okay. Thank you, Venerable Jue Wei, also a true Bodhisattva. Uh, I would like to share with everybody, never lose hope, even in moments of despair. Just look around you you will find your Kalyanamitras, the Bodhisattvas, who will pull you along, who will help you get back on your feet. Keep trying, keep going. You are in good hands. Thank you. And Dr. Lancaster. During this time of the COVID in this country where so many people died and so many people were sick, the wonderful thing is that I felt that I was surrounded by heroes. All of those selfless people who go to those hospitals and take care of these people, they're heroes. 
all of the people out there in the world who, who brought our food to us, who continue to allow us to live. I feel so thankful that I live at a time, I call them heroes, maybe I should call them bodhisattvas. Thank you, thank you so much. And for that tribute as well to all our frontline workers. Pratnya Paramita teaches us that every experience, including pleasant Dharma encounters, will give way to cessation. There's nothing to hold on to. We have now come to the end of the panel on Prajna Paramita in the humanistic Buddhism perspective. But the end is really not the end and therefore it is the end. Please continue to join us in the series of 10 lectures on humanistic Buddhism for further insights and wisdom. You may subscribe to Fo Guangshan English Dharma Service YouTube channel to hear more from Venerable Miao Guang and other Fo Guangshan Venerables. Or the University of the West Department of Religious Studies YouTube channel for some recent talks from Dr. Lancaster. And also, not forgetting to visit the Nantian Institute website to find out about the world's first graduate certificate in humanistic Buddhism. Again, thank you to Dr. Lancaster, Venerable Miao Guang, and to everyone online for staying online to this very last minute. We hope everyone keeps safe and healthy in both body and mind. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>